Welcome to this sixth meeting of the Time for Action webinars organized by Volus um, Academy of Theological Studies, taking place once a month, more or less. So I would like to welcome you all to this event. Some um, guidelines for those of you who want to follow the event in English, since we have uh, simultaneous interpreting, you can push on the globe at the lower part of your site and choose the language that you want to listen to. For those of you who want to ask a question after the two speeches, you can either raise the digital hand and you can ask your question live, or you can use the Q&A feature or the chat where you can write your question. I will repeat the same in English. I'd like to welcome you to this sixth uh, meet online meeting in the context of the Time for Action series of online meetings organized by the Volus Academy for Theological Studies. For those who'd like to join us uh, in English, there's the option of interpretation, in front of you on the menu bar of, web, of, of Zoom webinar, you can choose the globe with interpretation and then select your uh, the English language. You can also use the Q&A uh, section also as well as the chat box to provide to the speakers uh, written uh, questions, but also you can raise your virtual hand that have the opportunity to uh, speak directly to the to the panelists. So, I would like to ask from our two panelists, Mrs. Effie Foka and Hara Laboswentis, to um, open the microphones and cameras. Firstly, we will give the floor to Mrs. Foka, who is an assistant professor of international relations and European affairs at the American College of Press, and she's going to speak about the issue that we are discussing today, and namely the religion in the public sphere in between the fundamentalism, populism, and democracy. Hello, everyone. Christ is rising. Nico, thank you very much for your invitation. This is a very honoring invitation because I I do appreciate the work that you do in the Volus Academy. And I really appreciate that I am in this event together with Mr. Ventis. And I am really glad for the uh, discussion that we are going to have. I'm going to speak very specifically and practically for the situation in Yes, and then I hope that we will have a more general discussion. As you know, I didn't know if I should speak in Greek or in English. I have been living for 15 years in Greece, and I think I'm rather ashamed that I cannot speak in Greek for my work. So I will uh, have a short introduction in Greek, and then I will change and will speak in English. I'm always interested in on religion in Greece, both as an insider and as an outsider. Since I have been living here for 15 years, my parents migrated in the USA and I came back to Greece. And I have also spent some time in the UK. Uh, my research focuses on religious in Greece and not mainly. I write only in English. And when it comes to religion and politics, Despite the fact that I live here in Greece um, for a lot of years, focuses both on the point of view of the insider and the outsider. And I always compare the situation in Greece and abroad. So this is a rather easy situation for me. So when I understood the topic that we are going to discuss, the religions in the public sphere, uh, I remember the work 
of some researchers uh, did, and most specifically about the book of Nadia Marzuki, Duncan McDonnell, and uh, the very well-known uh, Olivier Roy. This book is titled in English, Shaving the People, How Populists Hijack Religion. So this is what um, I remembered when you uh, gave me this topic for the discussion, because I think that this is a very interesting topic when it comes to religion in the Greek public sphere. There are a lot of voices, very different voices in the Greek public sphere that um, claim to represent, so to say, the broad category of religion in Greece, and more specifically, the uh, Greek Orthodox Christianity. And I prefer to people who claim that they are part of the Greek Orthodox Christianity. So the term that Marzuki, McDonald, and Roy um, use is very interesting. And unfortunately, I cannot speak about those issues in Greek. First of all, I couldn't find the right way to translate the concept of hijacking in Greek when it comes to religion. So the, I found things that have to do with various uh, bad things like hijacking an airplane, but it was difficult for me to express, to interpret the word hijacking risk. The Academy has translated uh, the verb hijacking as tapilevo in Greek, and I believe that this is uh, a very good choice, and it is something that we kept listening to the public discourse. Nevertheless, this is where I will change and will start speaking in honest and fair, the problem with the term hijacking is not purely linguistic um, and it's not purely a matter of translation. The term itself is pregnant with problems when applied to religion because it assumes that there is one authentic or correct voice of religion which is somehow being hijacked, stolen or taken over by populace. Um, so let me make clear from the beginning that I don't assume there's one true or correct voice of religion. Uh, I don't assume that the church either narrowly defined as an institution or uh, more broadly defined to include all of its believers, uh, that nor do I believe that it entails an authentic or correct voice necessarily. Um, basically, I make no assumptions about any authentic or correct voice of religion. Uh, rather, for my discussion today, I simply want to explore that inherently problematic concept of hijacked religion in relation to the Greek context and to examine this picture comparatively with what scholarship tells us about intersections between religion and populism in other contexts. So I'll first discuss some scholarship on religion and populism. I'll then present results of a very light mapping I've done uh, um, of some themes at the intersection between religion and, and populism in Greece in recent months. And then I'll return to the scholarship for a comparative assessment of the Greek case. So first on the scholarship on religion and populism, I'll focus on the work of Rogers Brubakers. I'm not sure how familiar our audience is with Brubaker. Uh, he is a sociologist based at the University of California in Los Angeles. He's written extensively on and authoritatively on social theory, on nationalism, on populism. And in relation to all of that, he frequently engages the topic of religion. Uh, regarding the more recent expressions of populism in Europe, he describes a rather intense and often new emphasis on Christianity in populist rhetoric, but an emphasis which both he and Olivier Roy describe as Christianism rather than Christianity. This is an identitarian rather than sincerely religious values focused Christianity, and it's one which is defined especially in opposition to the Islamic other. At points, certainly both perspectives sound a little bit like Huntington's uh, perspective, a bit like the clash of civilizations approach. And in fact, Brubaker specifically uses the term civilization, indicating that the religious related populism that he's describing is a civilizational Christianism. That's what he calls it. And importantly, he says that this form of religion related populism we find especially in Northern and Western Europe. He indicates that the situation is different in Central and Eastern Europe. And I'll present his descriptions and later we can discuss where in this kind of map, Greece fits in the picture. So the new religion related populisms that prevail in Northern and Western Europe tend to focus on Christian identity. But as I said before, a Christianity that is invoked not so much as a religion, but as a civilizational identity, which is understood as antithetical to Islam. This European Christian identity embraces secularism and it also embraces liberalism. 
so that it champions gender equality, it champions same-sex rights. Uh, it is secularized Christianity as culture in Brubaker's terms. And he says in these words, crudely put, if quote unquote, they are Muslim, then quote, we must be in some sense Christian. But that does not mean that we must be religious. So basically Islam is seen as too religious to be secular and it is thus incompatible with European secularized Christianity. By contrast, according to Brubaker in Central and Eastern Europe, we do find here too an identitarian focus on Christianity and anti-Islamic rhetoric, but not secularism or liberalism. And the anti-Islamic rhetoric is focused more on the threats to security rather than the threats to identity. So where does Greece fit into this picture? Um, to address this question, uh, I'll turn now to what I described as my mapping of some uh, main voices or messages about religion in the contemporary Greek public space. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus specifically on the political in the public sphere uh, and specifically, more specifically on political party discourse. Um, I by no means suggest that in, in general we should limit the definition of public sphere to the political, um, much less to party politics. Um, but as I said with Professor Vandy's talk, I hope we'll move from the narrow to the more general and we'll discuss more broadly in the question time. And I'm going to further limit my analysis to references to religion in the public political discourse in the last few months. I'm really interested in this pre-electoral period, this uh, period leading up to the European elections and the rhetoric around religion uh, and populism there. So this is a limitation both for the sake of manageability and because, as I indicated before, I think this time has been really ripe for consideration of intersections between religion and populism in Greece. Uh, the voices I examine are a cacophonous array. I'm not trying to sensationalize or give more attention to already over-attended to sometimes vulgar expressions around religion in the Greek public sphere. Um, I'm not trying to summarize them or to generalize about them, rather through a, an, an admittedly non-systematically collected hodgepodge of religion-related expressions in the public space. I simply want to draw some main themes and some milestones from this European pre-electoral uh, period uh, tending to some contours that we can then assess uh, in relation to discussions about intersections between populism and religion outside the Greek context. So what does this picture look like from an external perspective? So here I am on the mapping. In its early days, at least in this electoral period, it was rather strongly marked by discussions and debates around the new legislation on same-sex marriage. So a first milestone entails yet another chapter in the perennial debates on church-state relations because Archbishop Hieronymos had sought to intervene in the matter, um, asking for a referendum to be held on the issue, and then explicitly requesting that the votes that were cast by each parliamentarian be made public. Um, our audience will be familiar with the whole story. I'll just simply note that there were also calls by some higher arts, the parliamentarians who would vote in favor of same-sex marriage ought to be excommunicated by the church, and or barred from uh, religious rights. Um, those voices did not win. In the end, uh, the perhaps strongest display of negative reaction from the church as an institution was the drastic change to the traditional celebration of the first Sunday of Lent, the Sunday of Orthodoxy. So the politicians were excluded from the celebration, from the formal celebration, and the hierarchs did not have dinner as they normally do with the uh, president of the republic. So all of that was just a symbolic snubbing of the government for its having pushed forward with a decision contrary to the institutional church's will. So the main message we take from this milestone in the public discourse is that the church remains steadfast in its biblical interpretation of the meaning of marriage. It will communicate its discontent with the state um, and with state policies that are contrary to its interpretation. And it will mildly punish the state uh, by turning a cold shoulder to it, at least for a short time, uh, but it doesn't want to risk close church state relations over this. So the topic of same sex marriage appears again in another milestone I'll address later, but if I take them in chronological order, what could be called a second milestone came in the form of discussions around the Syriza party leaders, um, Stefanos Kasselaki's statements regarding a miracle that took place uh, at his baptism. This also gave birth to a very interesting discussion uh, in Greece. His statements provoked uh, an eruption of debates regarding whether a representative of the left can or should, in principle, believe in miracles. Um, whether the leader of the left, a leader of the left, should be making any claims regarding religious belief. 
This line of discussion continued much later with Kasselakis' um, public declaration that he is indeed a believer, and also with the public questioning of his religious belief. Um, there was one particularly interesting article in Efsin entitled, do you, do you really believe in miracles, Mr. Kasselakis? Um, and again, the discussion arose around whether a representative of the political left in Greece can legitimately be openly making religious claims. These debates included a rather tragic comic discussion of references to the triptych fatherland, faith, and family, Patristis Kiaikogenia, with Kasselakis critiquing one uh, new democracy politician's use of this Hunda slogan, and then Kasselakis being critiqued by a former Syriza member of parliament um, for his own references to that slogan. Um, Kasselakis was saying that the fatherland, the faith, and the family must be freed from the monopoly on them held by the right. So in general, there's a very lively discussion of who gets to use this slogan and what it means if he uses it. Now we in this seminar may argue that it means nothing actually, and that it's a wholly superficial attempt by politicians to win some of the far right vote. Um, but I would argue that it still leaves an imprint on the public sphere that this instance of what perhaps could be called reverse blasphemy with the unholy slogan of fatherland, faith and family used in vain uh, provoked more or less a superficial discussion of who in the political space can and should make claims regarding the fatherland, the faith and the family in Greece. Um, as another milestone on the timeline, I identify when uh, Eliniki Lisi, President Kiriakos Velopoulos, suggested that those members of parliament of, who voted in favor of same-sex marriage should avoid going to church during Holy Week. Uh, the statement was especially controversial because it carried undertones of a threat uh, of violence against these members of parliament since that statement had come and it had been preceded by uh, an expression of violence in the church against a member of parliament who did in fact vote in favor of same-sex marriage. So there were two main dimensions to this issue, a politician publicly suggesting um, who does or does not have the right or in any case ought not attend church. And the other dimension is that of the debatably more or less encouragement of violence against members of parliament in question. So the first dimension is what's relevant for our purposes. What imprint is left on the public sphere when a far right politician claims, whether directly or indirectly, the role of gatekeeper of the church? And this specifically due to a negative reaction to same sex marriage. Another element of this discussion was the reaction of the institutional church with Archbishop Hieronymus and other clerics publicly admonishing Velopoulos for his words and indicating that everyone is welcome in the church, the church is about love, and certainly we're not excluding people from the church, and uh, that there is no Christianometer measuring our degrees of faith. Uh, the Archbishop's words were echoed by Prime Minister Mitsotakis in his efforts to undermine the connection between the far right and the religious vote. He said, we saw this in previous elections too. Some people tried to instrumentalize patriotism and our faith. These are not serious ways of behaving. No one should play with orthodoxy. No one interest instrumentalizing the faith. We are all orthodox Christians. There is no Christianometer and you should turn your backs on all those who try this deplorable manipulation of the religious feelings of Greek society. Whether we should interpret Mitsotaki's statement that we are all Orthodox Christians as also an expression of populism uh, invites discussion, and maybe we'll discuss that later. But certainly here too, we have a very clear effort to win some of the votes that might go to the far right instead, specifically because of religious sentiments of the voters. As for that far right, uh, I'll now address some examples of the content of the expressions of religion related populism uh, that we find amongst relevant political parties. So for this, I'll draw on some expressions in their current political campaigns. Velopoulos' Eliniki Lisi predictably also made in indirect reference to the fatherland, the faith and the family. Um, that triptych uh, in one TV advert, the party claims that they, meaning the current Greek government, are breaking Greece apart. They had a map of uh, on the screen showing Greece separated from Cyprus. They are also said to be breaking religion apart and they are breaking the family apart. And then that comes as a, a rainbow flag is displayed across the screen suggesting that same sex rights are dissolving the Greek family. In a longer uh, 10 minute spot, Velopoulos refers to Prime Minister Mitsotakis' critique that Velopoulos had been inciting people to violence uh, when he warned that pro-same-sex pro marriage parliamentarians shouldn't go to church, uh, Velopoulos responded by saying that what's really violent is the division of Greeks into anti-Christians and Christians. And what is also violent is essentially to impose laws such as that on same-sex marriage, which divide an entire society. 
for its part, the political party Niki, so one more uh, addition here, uh, in its Euro election campaign, uh, refers to Europe as having a lost identity and Europe is a den of anti-Christian obsessions. So this fear of, um, of an undermining of Greek Christian identity. The party also makes reference to the greatness of much pained Greekness and to the light of our sun-soaked orthodoxy. Um, Spartiates have been excluded from the Euro elections, but from the last round of campaigning uh, and its ad um, narrated by uh, Elias Kassidiadis, emphasized the maintenance of our national and religious identity and indicated in its vision for the light of Hellenism to shine across the world. This ad also makes reference to the fight to defend Christianity. And we also have some more fringe groups like uh, Fotini Latinopoulos, uh, Voice of Logic Party. In this party's campaign, we have expressions of fear of the Islamization of Europe. So that harkens back to what uh, Brubaker is saying about um, populism and, and religion, but with a twist. Rather ironically, one of the party's complaints is that Muslims are intolerant, that they treat women and homosexuals like second class citizens. But then in the advert, they also claim that Europe is being taken over by non-Christian values, including same-sex rights to marriage. So practically in the same breath, they are both anti-gay and anti-Muslim in part because Muslims are anti-gay. Um, another more fringe group, uh, Kini Maiko Siena, Movement 21, also expresses an anti-Islamic voice, but without, it seems, accompanying references to Christianity or to orthodoxy. Islam appears in the party's online presence, at least, more as a threat because of what it represented at the time of the 1821 revolution against the Ottoman Empire, a threat to the nation itself, a threat to national sovereignty and national integrity, rather than a threat to Christian identity and uh, Christian values. Um, Okay, so again, I don't aim in this mapping to be thorough or to generalize, but rather to paint a picture of the diversity of expressions which make reference to religion in the public political sphere. Uh, and then based on that, to try to draw some the various threads together to locate the Greek context in that broader context. So what we find at the intersection between religion and populism in the Greek public space, in the last few months at least, are first, a delicate handling of church-state relations, whereby the institutional church expresses its dogmatic opposition to certain state policy, that on same-sex marriage, but without endangering its close relations with the state. We also have a careful distancing of the institutional church from the far right, emphasizing that the church welcomes all and that no one has the right to exclude others from the church. And we also find mostly indirect claims to represent the faith, to be able to speak publicly as its representative or as a member of it, and this we find not in all parties, but we find it right across the political spectrum, except amongst the far left. So, so far from those points, we can at least determine that the references to Christianity in the Greek context are not empty of religious content. They're not Christianism that's simply, uh, that's a secularized Christianism, as Brubaker describes uh, as prevalent in the Northern and Western uh, of Europe. Um, rather, they are real religious values at play and under discussion, and representations of the faith are not purely cultural, but rather they have reference to content, such as belief in miracles, or participation in church services and rites. Does this fact automatically place Greece on the Eastern side of Brubaker's slanted division of Europe? So with the Central and Eastern European context? Um, not quite, uh, because alongside the above mentioned characteristics, we also have very prevalent references to the relationship between uh, religion and national identity, between Christian orthodoxy and Greekness. And this is more cultural and identitarian than theological for many. Meanwhile, we do have some expressions of illiberalism for example, the voices against same-sex marriage. Uh, and uh, as in much of Central and Eastern Europe, these um, expressions do not tend to be accompanied by security related, sorry, so in contrast, sorry, to the Central and Eastern European context, the Islamism, anti-Islamism is not securely re security related in the Greek context, from what I see anyway. Um, we all read in the public discourse regarding references to the fatherland, the faith and the family evidence of the fact that the threats to each are deemed as different across the Greek political sphere and the Greek political discourse. So for some, the threats of the fatherland are the governing parties insufficiently aggressive nationalism. For others, uh, it is immigration, but not necessarily Muslim immigration. For some, the threats to the faith are secularization and church state separation. And for others, the main threats to the faith are liberalism, like same-sex marriage. 
For some, the threat to the family is same-sex marriage and illiberalism, sorry, liberalism again. And for others, it is far-right monopoly on what family means. So the train is rather complex on this point. And I'd say the train is rather complex in part because it, is, it includes left-wing religion-related populism, which is often excluded from any analyses. For example, Marzuki, McDonald, and Roy in that book on saving the population, uh, saving the people, um, is focused only on right-wing populism. So we have a, a more complex terrain in the Greek context. But the terrain is also complex because of the inherent contradictions, which Brubaker describes also in general in populism. In his words, bound by no stable, substantive, ideological, or programmatic commitments, populism is distinctively and chronically eclectic, given to instrumentalizing whatever issues seem exploitable at the moment. And so the story is laced with ironies and reversals, such as the fact that secularism is criticized by the left and reclaimed by the right in the North and Western Europe. In Greece, to some extent, maybe we see secularism criticized by the left, if we consider uh, Kasselaki's claims to uh, religion uh, um, and to that it's okay to be religious and leftist as a, uh, a reclaiming of, of uh, and a critique of secularism. And uh, also though secularism is not being reclaimed by the right, though liberalism is, if we consider uh, new democracies, same-sex uh, marriage support. So the, the uh, space is complex. I don't think Greeks said uh, falls very well in this uh, categorization, um, not perfectly so in any case, but we can, we can uh, debate the utility of that uh, division that Brubaker proposes in any case. I've offered only a snapshot of religion-related populism in the Greek context, and it's a very limited one at that, but I hope it's sufficient just to spark some discussion uh, later amongst us all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Effie, for this very comprehensive and interesting um, speech that will help us discuss it further on. And now I will go to the second speaker, Professor Hello, everyone. I would like to thank you for this very interesting speech, Effie. Very quickly for me, first of all, something that is related with my background. I like the model of political liberalism of John Rawls, when I was interested in political philosophy, maybe it would be very helpful if our listeners could bear in mind that I studied theology from a choice, and I am an observant, uh, I believe, I am a believer. I'm an observant Christian Orthodox, but I was always interested in political philosophy. And I am in favor of democracy. There is no question about that, no doubt about that. And I am always in favor of um, protecting human rights. I do believe that this is fully uh, in the spirit of the Bible in the spirit of our Christ. And I will come back to that point later. So, when it comes to roles, very shortly, since I have undertaken the role to give the theory in this discussion, after the war, when the Western world and the whole world uh, tried to recover from uh, the war and tried to build up uh, the civilized world from scratch, political philosophy was considered that something finished, so to say. This, what was prevalent was the spirit of um, a British, uh, a British school of morality, and the so-called utilitarianism. There was a wonderful book titled On Liberty. So utilitarianism is a 
theory of the common mind and it is not by chance that it came from uh, the great britain it is affected by british uh, other british philosophical currents such as empiricism and it appears to give solutions to mass is to some issues it speaks about seeking the best possible uh, the best possible benefit for uh, most of the people this sounds nice but the problem here seems to be that uh, uh, it does not talk about what is fair or not fair per se but a moral decision is judged based on its consequences. So it does not care about the people and therefore it is possible to uh, create cases of Evgenias, so to say. So Rose was the person that brought about a decisive split with that model of utilitarianism. It shook up the political theory when in 1970s it published its first major work on the theory of justice. Then Rawls puts utilitarianism aside and talks in the political uh, theory, the Kantian uh, theory, meaning that it introduces Kantianism and draws inspiration from Kant. And it establishes, he establishes Kant since Kant believes that um, later on, Rawls rethought on those issues, and in 1975, talked on political liberalism. And then he tries to correct some mistakes of his previous book. However, that theory of justice is still a very important book until today and proposes a model that focuses on the issue of religion and the so-called inclusive dogmas in public uh, sphere, in the public sphere. And this model is very interesting. Rawls has been an American uh, thinker he used to be observant, he used to be religious in his youth. And if memory serves me right, he also uh, wanted to become a priest, but after all, he decided to become a political philosopher. However, since he was uh, an American, he does not agree exactly with the French model of la cité, which uh, is rather complex uh, for Americans, if we could say so. So Rawls is not an atheist or a, a person who believes that religion is a problem per se. However, what I like in, about uh, his philosophy is that political liberalism, which by the way, could not be identified with social neoliberalism. The word liberalism is a spectrum, so to say, which includes the knowledge actions, the commitment for having for allowing free commerce and the right to property, personal property. Nevertheless, there are various degrees in which a liberal person agrees ecumenical freedom and liberality. There is the 
model of Thatcher. Mm -hmm. And there are also other forms of liberalism, which are more Keynesian, so to say. Rawls uh, was uh, uh, accused that uh, he was a rather socialist and uh, libertarian. Norbert Nozick wrote against the first book of uh, the theory of justice. So let's go back to the issue of religion. That model, I agree, not fanatically, of course, because no human theory is perfect, of course. But I believe, in my opinion, that is the most suitable for the real world in which we live, a world which is becoming more and more complex, more and more pluralistic, a world if you wish, in which it is always very difficult to have uh, concrete uh, ideas and ideological coherence. Rawls promotes uh, not atheism, but uh, respect to all religions and freedom of religion, freedom of religious beliefs. And this is not something given in the Greek society. Unfortunately, public discourse is done based on emotions and not based on um, uh, arguments. There are a lot of people who uh, say that they are liberals, neoliberals, liberals rather, and they do not like religion since they believe that if the religious phenomena will be extinct from the earth, at least the three monotheistic religions, the belief that religious is a threat and only a threat. Rawls made it clear from the first moment that political liberalism cannot speak on metaphysics, on religions, on dogmas, does not look down on various dogmas and religions. Religious dogmas are not unsuitable for an era, such, uh, an era of secularization. at uh, the European Enlightenment, does not promote atheism as a prerequisite for uh, the world of justice and democracy, such as Cornelius Castorinades and uh, others. For those philosophers, such as Castorinades, uh, atheism is a sine qua non condition for uh, having autonomous societies. Since, according to Astoriade, in order to have a state of law, if a society cannot be autonomous, if it does not have autonomous citizens. Therefore, a citizen who is observant, who is religious, cannot contribute to the creation, to the establishment of autonomous society. Since it has a uh, religious ideas that does not allow them to uh, think freely. Rawls believes that this would be paternalistic, meaning that uh, Astoriades and Rawls did, that, uh, that they believe that we should leave uh, religion behind, not only as people, but also as societies. That would be for Rawls the paternalistic, let's say, um, idea. As a liberal person, he is against demonizing religion um, per se. So what does Rawls do? And uh, let me say that it is very interesting for believers the fact that he includes atheism in the so-called inclusive dogmas. Or, or better, do comprehensive doctrines and dogmas, which are doctrines 
that have a metaphysical uh, content. He believes that atheism is not the opposite of religion when it comes to a person being a neutral and objective. He says that atheism is not a religion He says, what, however, that atheism is a metaphysical position, a metaphysical belief, because it says that there, there is nothing in the universe apart from what we can see and understand with our senses. So, he, according to Rawls, this is a comprehensive doctrine. And this is why, uh, when it comes to Rawls, what is at stake is not the establishment of a state without religion, an atheistic state, because atheism became uh, as oppressive as the other uh, forms of religion. It is a form of opposite theocracy, uh, and we have seen that in the previous Soviet countries and uh, in Albania, since belief was uh, uh, not allowed at all. And uh, we know now all those problems after the fall of communism in Albania. So, according to Rose, a state. Uh, an atheistic state is of no value at all. However, uh, what is of value is a state that respects all religion. However, the question is, in reality, how can a state have allow people to respect all religions since states usually carry a long-standing and long-term tradition? But this is something that can be discussed. We can think about those issues. Let's start, first of all, from accepting and understanding that there is a, a gap between the atheistic state and a state that respects all forms of religion. But why should its a state be um, a state of law that respects all religions? And now, uh, I would like to say that uh, since Christianity represents something good, it talks about love, uh, of justice, talks of love and justice. Why should any government or the state, why should a government take distance from that metaphysic tradition and not use it and not uh, use it in order to um, make uh, laws. but And this is a very good question, but if we were to go deeper, one will start, will start to understand that respecting all religions is a sine qua non condition to any state that wants to be a state of uh, law. But the, a rule of law means that all citizens are equal. Uh, in a rule of law state, all citizens have the same obligations. Political liberalism cannot talk about obligations. This is not an anarchist system that focuses on rights and not obligation. And Sotitria Dafilou has written something very good that in a society where people have only obligations, they are treated as animals. But in a society where people have only rights, they, the people that have only rights and no obligations, uh, behave uh, like animals. So when a state has got uh, or rather favors a uh, specific doctrine or religion, then, even if having the best possible intentions, the citizens that do not 
adhere to that doctrine, either because they are atheist or because they follow uh, some other religion or some other doctrine, they became citizens, lesser citizens, so to say. And unfortunately, there is the phenomenon according to which, and which is evident. I think that this is the case also in Greece, that undoubtedly an organized religion, given the time, becomes an institution. So the institutionalization of an organized religion makes it sometimes dangerous if they have political power. And why is that? Because the institutionalized religion will try to impose its own regulatory principles to society as a whole. And this is, of course, fatal because it is against the spirit of the Christ and the Bible. Since Christ said everyone who wants can follow me, no one can be uh, made into following the Christ and, and be forced uh, to become a member of the church. But unfortunately, in the institutionalized church, does not understand it and does not respect it. For example, all that um, discourse against the same-sex marriage from the church was incomprehensible, but it shows that the church feels threatened that it is uh, it, it, its power is uh, uh, reduced and wants to uh, somehow, so to say, to retain its privileges, the privileges that it enjoyed all those years. And this is why the church reacts to any kind of reform that is not against belief, not against the interests of church, but in reality tries to uh, define uh, the role within a rule of law, that it is not self-explanatory that all Greek citizens are observant Christian Orthodox are Orthodox Christians and they all have to live according to uh, the laws of Christianity. So political liberalism, since I don't want to bore you with a lot of details, is, and by the way, let me say something else that the political liberalism does not prohibit to any believer of any doctrine to express their opinion for any given issue that would be against democracy but what political liberalism what it is in favor of is that it imposes on specific citizens and representatives of religious doctrines a political a discourse, a political language that is suitable for the public dialogue. And I will give you an example in order to be clear. Western societies, and this is a blessing, are societies that evolve and reflect on themselves. So, during that reflection that takes place in stages, new questions arise that were unknown or unthinkable in previous times. So, when a body of elected representatives of the citizens or groups of citizens Hold upon to reflect and give their opinion on a proposed reform, it would be good to know that the public sphere can have a specific idiom, a specific language. When we discuss, for example, about the death penalty, which of course in Europe is not an issue, but 
some states of the United States of America do have the death penalty. And unfortunately, um, lately, uh, this is done rather violently. However, when uh, there is this a dialogue on death penalty, that language of political liberalism says that there is no point whatsoever for any person to speak in favor or against death penalty by saying that, listen, I am Muslim or Christian or Jew or Jehovah witness or an atheist, and therefore, due to my tradition, I am in favor or against death penalty. This is uh, not useful. This is only a noise that does not add any useful to the political discourse. If you want to participate as a citizens to that discourse, to that dialogue, you can bring arguments to the table that would be able to convince people that do not uh, follow your own doctrine. The same goes with abortions. There is no meaning whatsoever to say that the church condemns abortions or that religious be, religion or that Christianity is against abortions. So me as a Christian, I am against abortions. This has no meaning whatsoever. If you want to support abortions or condemn abortions, you should have to bring evidence that uh, that life starts uh, in the womb and so that a fetus is a person and it is a pity to terminate that life. If you can do that, then all is well, but you cannot uh, bring into the table the Bible or any other religious text and says that this is my argument, this is what my religion uh, believes. So it is like having a Mus Muslim or a Jehovah Witness and saying that, yes, whatever you may say, I personally will not eat pork because any argument whatsoever may might believe or might say that eating pork is just like eating poultry or veal, but I will not do that. This is a sin for me because this is written in my religious texts. And if you want to abstain from pork, yeah, who you may you you may do that. Nobody uh, will make you eat pork, but there is a huge problem when you want to uh, uh, make also other citizens to abstain from pork as well. There are some European schools that uh, have uh, Muslim parents that say that uh, schools should not serve pork as a meal. Now, when it comes to abortions, people who are against abortions either for religious reasons or for other reasons, because I had a, an atheist professor of philosophy who believed that abortion uh, when it is taking place without any serious reason was a crime. In that case, people would have to think if that uh, justifies the general stop of abortions. What are the benefits and what are the disadvantages and what kind of the society would we have when abortions would be illegal? Which will be the consequences of that decision? Now, if we want to to shed some light into the discussion, abortions would continue to take place 
and according to statistics, would take place even more, but always under the table in shady places irresponsibly and will be conducted by uh, physicians that uh, will not have to uh, answer to any laws. We will have more victims since those physicians would uh, be able to hold power on those women. And we will have a reality that would make the termination of a pregnancy, even uh, even when there are reasons, really difficult or impossible. So, if your organized religion believes that abortions should be avoided because they are a crime, etc., you should address the members of your community and explain to them, however, why it, this is so why the members of your community should abstain from having abortions. Now, the state that respects religious freedom, spot a rule of law, and should uh, maintain uh, distances from any kind of metaphysics, atheism included, because religious and orthodox included find it difficult to adapt to this uh, secularized world, and they um, react not in the best possible way when they feel that their power is diminished and they are put aside. Unfortunately, they succumb very often, one would say, to populism, to letting the past, to doubting uh, uh, the reason, and unfortunately, they do not reflect. A religion that does not reflect, and when it comes to Christianity, uh, I don't mean reflecting on the Christological doctrine uh, and such, but when it comes to anthropology and the world, a religion, an organized religion that does not reflect on the worldly issues and speaks to people of the 21st century with the knowledge that we have of human beings in the first century after Christ is potentially dangerous because it speaks about things that have been um, proven wrong and keeps its believers to a kind of childhood. We have believers that they do not reflect and they are unwilling and unable to look with a cool head of any social issue that is discussed in the public sphere, is brought about in the public dialogue. I don't want to bore you with a lot of details. I just let me say that a healthy religion should not be afraid of respecting other religions. Evgenius Vulgaris, a well-known Orthodox priest, talked about respecting other religions Unfortunately, uh, that spirit is not respected anymore since the European Enlightenment uh, was brought in Greece in very shady times, very difficult times, and it was brought in Greece mainly by uh, priests. Now, uh, when it comes to Orthodox Church, I firmly believe that if the Church wants to, uh, have to bring more peoples, that will not be done with the help of the state or the police. That will be done with the quality of its discourse. The question is, does the church, does Orthodox Church have a qualitative discourse? Do we have, um, do we talk about uh, the spirit of the Christ and of the uh, Holy Scripture? Or uh, 
they are like uh, the Paris is. And I, when I talk to my students, I say to them that the only real dilemma that a believer uh, may uh, have in all their lives is if they are going to follow the Christ or the Pharisees. And a lot of times it is, it might be easy to sleep and follow the Pharisees because when it comes to the Pharisees, the reality is very simple. It is uh, easy to choose. And since Pharisaism is always easy because it has a lot of piety around it which does not fall for critical thought and can uh, uh, attract people in a very easy way. Now maybe we can open up the floor for Q&A or a dialogue. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ventis, for this uh, wonderful um, speech. I don't know if Mrs. Foucault would like to make a comment or an intervention to what we have listened before uh, having questions from the audience. Yes, uh, manipulate the time and take too much time, but uh, I just want to say I really enjoyed your talk. I would love to hear a part two. <laughs> I'd love to hear you um, bring roles into conversation with Habermas and go further with that and then bring uh roles uh, with habermas on the question of religion in the public sphere and then on the question of the neutrality of the state bring roles in the conversation with cecile laborde um i would thoroughly enjoy two more lectures on these on these topics mm -hmm. i want to say i i um so i'm a student of politics and i've studied roles as a as a student of politics and i teach roles uh, uh in that context and um for my field roles is uh you know like a a, a real innovator a very fresh voice coming in the 1970s and returning the study of politics to the study of politics as having some normative dimension. You know, after the behavioral revolution, where there was this emphasis on empirical studies only of, of, of politics and you know, political science, which uh, doesn't uh, sit well with me at all. So, um, so uh, he's very much revered and respected for this. Uh, and you know, from the 1970s, like you say, the theory of justice. And then I think it was like you said, 1993, and then his political liberalism that he starts to talk about the importance of. Uh, allowing space for religion in discussion in the public sphere. And I just, I'm so glad that you bring this up because I think that drives well with what I was discussing, for example, uh, about the reactions to Kasselakis talking about his, his faith. You know, the idea that the left cannot uh, speak in terms of religion and, and that we're talking in, you know, uh, in the year 2024 um, after he's written these things in 1993. And I think that discussion, I'm sure it's been had in Greece. I'm not very familiar with the Greek political um, philo philosophical space, uh, but it's not been accepted, I think, so much by society overall. So I think it's, it's fascinating and a little bit, or rather very disappointing that we're still at this stage uh, in, in this context. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Sophie. Talk. I enjoyed it. Indeed, uh, actually, if, yeah, as you know already, um, uh, Habermas had been in discuss in conversation with uh, with Rawls, and uh, that uh, the conversation had been um, included in uh, the volume of political liberalism published by Columbia University Press, and uh, 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 this is a great uh, incentive to maybe try um, a couple more lectures uh, together and uh, uh, discuss further about these issues. Sounds good. So we have a question from the audience. Mr. Andreas Alexopoulos. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You can ask your question. Congratulations to the Academy and to the two speakers for its wonderful speeches. First of all, I believe that what Professor Vende said is very important that the private sphere, which is the main idea behind secularization, is the main belief of Christianity. And the, I want to ask two questions if Professor has got some time. First of all, according to what he has said about Castoriades, 
we could say that atheism is a moral theory and the second is in this best christian era uh, is it good news or bad news for christianity so i don't believe that atheism can be considered as uh, a moral ideal saying uh, having a person who says that i i'm an observant christian i'm a believer that this is says us something about the quality of their character we might have a fundamentalist a very bad person in the soul who could uh, act in a very bad way and in his mind uh, he might believe that this uh, goes hand to hand with its uh, religious belief. No, atheism does not have a moral advantage. Maybe a, a person who is atheist and is, has the ability to think on a critical level has an advantage compared to a fundamentalist, but this is it. It doesn't mean that atheists are, will not be fundamentalists. Now, if this meta-Christian era where we live is a positive development for Christianity or not, in my opinion, yes, it is. Since it forces the institution of church, institutionalized church, to undertake its responsibilities and to start thinking more on the basis of the Holy Scripture and not as a, an institution that could uh, force its ideas on the uh, basis of its political power. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? I would like to ask a question to both our speakers. Until recently, we were used to, to understand that the church, at least in Greece, was combined with the uh, right-wing populism. But right now, Christian discourse is used also by the left-wing parties but again, in a populistic way, why do you believe that? Why do you believe that the church cannot uh, stand its whole, its own uh, uh, power? Why cannot the Greek church uh, shape such a field, such a neutral field? that will allow itself to play the real role that they can play in this society, why it allows itself to be used by political parties, so to say. I, I think uh, Professor Vendis gave us a very good hint in this regard, saying that um, he mentioned specifically our church, but he said generally churches, and I think I see it in the Orthodox Church much um, much more intensely maybe than others, uh, reacts to religious pluralism, is afraid of religious pluralism and uh, and kicks against it always, that any uh, diversity in this regard. And um, why is that the case? Uh, I, I have a very difficult time. I'm not, I'm not very comfortable being super critical openly of the church in public this way, but I have, I have a hard time with the extent to which um, the church relies on its close relations with the state rather than relying on um, a purely, um, not purely theological, but also social voice uh, saying things to its population that are interesting and important to its populations. Um, and not claiming the whole of the uh, of the population, but speaking to its own people, the, the, its members, um, in, on issues that are important to them uh, rather than 
expending so much energy on maintaining this very close relationship where this with the state where it allows it to play the role that it plays in religious education um i feel like it's more a handicap you know it's a crutch rather than uh, an active um uh, an active embodiment of a role the church can play in society that is much more clo closer to the people um and so i when i was saying i see it comparatively worse in the orthodox church i think you know, other faiths, and I don't take Brubaker's uh, perspective necessarily on that, they're all secularized, Christi secularized Christianities. I wouldn't say that's the case necessarily in Christianity in general in the West and in, uh, in uh, Northern Europe, but more, um, but Christianities that are more willing to uh, share the public space with other religious faiths, I think that's a key, key difference. Um, and yeah. So, an extra question to both people, to both our speakers. Usually, we tend to say that Greece is something special, a special case. Maybe this is also a special case. Is this the case? Is this a reality? Do we have any other state that has got uh, so close relationships with the church, or is Greece a peculiarity, a single case, so to say? Now, when it comes to your second question, Nikos, I would say that uh, Greece is not the only state. When, for example, Italy has got a religious state in, in, in Italy, the Vatican, which plays a very important role and affects political decisions. So Italian believers may think that they have to maintain this character, this characteristic of Catholicism for Italy as a state, because if that would be lost, Italy would lose its character, would lose its being, so to say, its essence. I believe that today, in a time when the nat when naturalism and material atheism, which has got uh, elements of science, gives answers that might be uh, might be, be something that is believed by people. Religious discourse, Christian, Orthodox religious discourse cannot, uh, cannot keep talking about or having us arguments only uh, cannot convince people only uh, about the past, speaking only about the past and about the role that the orthodoxy played in the shaping of the Greek modern state. If the Greek Orthodox Church uh, wants to survive, it should invite people again to the church. And that will happen only when people will feel that church is an honest, has an honest discourse with a sense of accountability and seriousness. Because, truth be told, people who have eyes can see. I am 57, but since I was a teenager, I could understand that the Greek society has got the facade of a religious people because the churches uh, are full of believers, especially uh, during their religious holidays, Easter and uh, the 15th of August. But in reality, the church has lost the majority of the critical thinking people in Greece. And for a lot of people, for a lot of educated people, this is proven by the increase of uh, secular uh, funerals. The Greek church is a church, and this is not my opinion, is a church suitable for small agricultural societies of the 19th century and nothing more is a church that never managed to 
have an urban character. And uh, the church has a lot of work to do. I know, in my opinion, in Greece, we have, since the 60s, an excellent academic theological discourse, and the church might could use it, but they don't want to do it. Nevertheless, populism is bad, whatever its source may be, and we should condemn it. I am glad, I was glad when I had the answer of uh, Archbishop Hieronymus to that uh, member of the parliament who, who made the, that very bad statement. This is a good start, a good place to start, a nice beginning. It is very unpleasant to have politicians that try to find voters in that group of believers by promising them that they uh, are with Christ. They try to sell uh, Christianity, and they um, try to find those faults to peoples that only think with their emotions. They cannot think critically. They just want to do that in order to uh, save part their election. So the church should instruct their community to be very, very careful against those kinds of populism. Religious populism is very dangerous. It's a very dangerous thing for an organized society. Thank you very much. We have three more questions. I don't know if I will uh, pronounce your name. Theo Kutrukis, if you could uh, if you could give the floor to Mr. Kutrukis. Hello. Can you listen to me? Reference was made to an article that said, Is God right wing in English? The Greek Orthodox Church. Is it is something above political geography and uh, should not be closer to any political party? Or should it, uh, let's say, try to go closer to a specific political party? The interpreter apologizes because the sound was not very good. And I think history has shown us that uh, in practice, the church um, tends to work closely with whatever government is in place for certain, uh, but it's a uh, it's uh, the the voters politically uh, they will tend to align. Uh, stronger believers uh, often tend to align uh, further with the right, but in terms of practice and how uh, it plays out politically, I think that um, you know we've seen uh, very similar um, symbolisms in the relationship between church and state across um, across the political spectrum. Can I just say something to the earlier question, though, Nico? Because about the yeah, absolutely exceptionally bad, <laughs> uh, and I want to agree with the. Professor Vendis, for sure, that uh, I don't think Greece is an exceptional case. I don't think orthodoxy is exceptional either in these issues. Um, but I think we have some very interesting specificities that really ought to be better understood. And so in the um, reactions to religious pluralism, for example, uh, why is it that um, orthodox, uh, majority orthodox contexts have a have a particularly bad record in human, human rights uh, protections? Um, uh, I wouldn't say particularly bad globally in all contexts, but it's really a striking uh, record. It's worth uh, trying to understand. And, and there, I think the relationship between church and state and religion and you know, orthodoxy and national identity and how these two sets of relationships constantly feed one another is really uh, key. And if you want to you know, look at some uh, specificities and, and differences, I think that's worth uh, you know, reviewing more carefully and through research as well. Okay. Thank you, Epi. Harlebe? Traditionally, in order to answer to our dear friend, Theodoris Kutrukis, traditionally, the church 
and the majority of its believers um, identified with the right-wing parties. And this can be explained for uh, uh, various reasons. They were, they, uh, unfortunately, the church is stuck to the past and not focusing on its eschatological identity. Since the fear of unknown uh, and the fear of future. So a lot of priests and a lot of believers tend to identify themselves with a party that was focusing on the past and allow them to feel all fuzzy and warm. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, left-wing parties in Greece, especially in the past, was um, in their majority atheistic, and therefore they have uh, uh, alienated a large part of the believers. A large part has alienated a large part of Orthodox Christians. Christianity is a, a vanguard, if you wish, it's an innovative movement, and it should look towards the future, which is undefined. Our homeland, as real homeland, is not the past, it is the Eschaton, it's not on the Byzantium or any other uh, idealized uh, period. The future has not been shaped yet, and this is why we are always uh, shaping the world and shaping ourselves towards the eschaton. Now, The church should uh, should not allow the political parties who want to uh, derive from each power should not allow it. That question is from Nikos Kuramenos. Kindly be succinct, Mr. Kuramenos. You have the floor. Can you, can you hear us? Yes. Yes, very well. Please be short and succinct. Hello, everyone. Congratulations to both our speakers. I'm afraid that uh, one of the last interventions by Mr. Ventis is the answer to my question. Nevertheless, since I had raised my digital hand, I am going to ask my question and maybe Mr. Ventis uh, will be able to make a short comment. So the Orthodox Church, since the early 80s, as it was mentioned earlier, is defeated in its fight with its modernization or the secularization of the Greek modern state, starting from the secular wedding until the uh, same-sex marriage recently or even earlier the legislation on the on erasing the doctrine from our id cards so in all those cases uh, there was a lot of discussion in church uh, journals from priests Nevertheless, the result was the same. The Greek society moved on, the reforms took place, and the church itself was forced, uh, given time to accept its defeat and to adapt to that new reality, to that new situation. Now, my question is the following. How 
can we interpret that uh, incapability of the Orthodox Church to adapt itself uh, or the unwillingness of the Church to adapt itself to that uh, modernization? Is this due to its institutional power, due to the fact that they don't want to lose the power? Or is there an even deeper problem, inherent problem? Maybe ontologically uh, is a pre-modern uh, entity, and that does not allow it to uh, understand modernity. This was my comment. This was my question. And I would like for a short comment, please. Thank you. Mrs. Foucault, do you want to add anything? No. Now, Mr. Ventes, you have the floor. Please be short. Thank you very much for your question. It, the church, unfortunately, has got a pre-modern um, discourse, but not ontologically so. I believe that the Holy Bible is a premature form of pre-modernity, and it is a pity to uh, allow the atheists to uh, take advantage uh, of that fact. Since in the New Testament, in the radical social changes that was brought about uh, by Christianity to the distinction between Caesar and the God, those rights that were given by the church in order not to allow for uh, uh, secular marriage or not to allow the same sex marriage, etc., all those are um, wrong fights, uh, and uh, it, in my opinion, it was wrong for the church to participate in that fight, and since it is sure that uh, it could not win that fight. Nevertheless, if following the spirit of Christ, in the spirit of Christ, and bearing in mind theological criteria, the church should be a vanguard. Uh, should be a pioneer in all those uh, uh, issues. And I can support that on, with theological arguments. Let's now go to the last question by Mr. Kosmidis. Hello from Xanthi. A short reaction comment on my behalf, or maybe food for thought for a next dialogue. If Christians reside in that world, uh, and this, of course, includes also, Christian politicians, it might be easy to build a political theology, but if you are a politician in the real world, then there are different priorities, one might say. It. So the issue in my behalf is how you will not lose that part of identity, that everything, power and systems, even ideas, are foreign to the nature to the essence of their biggest question, and on the other hand, to be able to face all those issues, especially when they have to manage political issues. And the second remark is that that difficulty is not taking place only in Greece or in the orthodoxy. Mrs. Fokov can uh, uh, say that also that the Catholic Church has the same problem in the States when it comes to how uh, Catholic politicians have the same issues. If they are allowed to participate in the Eucharist when they believe that the laws that they support are against the uh, uh, guidelines of the Catholic Church. Thank you very much, Mr. Cosmides. Mrs. Fokar, would you like to give an answer to make it? Then I guess I got, yeah, I, I missed some of the. Unfortunately, if I understood it correctly, it was whether, um, is it the case that the church ought to play the role to uh, hold politicians up to its standards and if it and exclude them when they behave uh, in a way that is contrary to church values. Is that correct? Was that the question? 
uh, I think that the church should be treating politicians the same as it does. Although I, I'm not in a position to answer these questions, I have to say. I don't feel like I'm in a position to answer the type of question. Like I said before, I'm, I'm a student of politics, but my perspective uh, as, uh, um, as an individual is that the church should not be treating politicians any differently than it does uh, its, uh, its normal um, population and, and believers. And it does not do that. It does not carry out this kind of exclusion of individuals. Um, uh, so I agree very much with the words of Hieronymus, of Archbishop Hieronymus, that the church uh, is love and it's welcoming of all uh, and in following and the things that Professor Vendi said as well, uh, following, following uh, what the, um, the, the Gospels uh, preach about treatment of individuals and including their beliefs, um, you wouldn't expect that that would be the right approach for the church to take. My perspective. Thank you very much, Mrs. Focas. Do you have any final remarks, Mr. Ventis? Politicians have the right to listen to the voice of the church. However, it is not allowed to be afraid to act according to the consciousness. If the decisions that they make are against the guidelines of the church, it is something different to listen with respect to what the church believes and says, and they are obliged to do that, and something completely different to do what the church believes. This is not. Uh, right for a rule of law and uh, for a state of democracy. So thank you very much after this wonderful discussion from our distinguished guests. It is about time to conclude. Before concluding, I would like to remind you that the next event of Time for Action will take place next Monday at the same time with a different topic, but uh, with very important um, speakers and uh, we will have once more David Bradshaw from the States and Father Christopher Knight from the UK. This is taking place uh, in collaboration with the Institute of Orthodox Studies of Cambridge. I would like to thank the speakers, I would like to thank the participants, the attendees, and I would like to wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having us. Goodbye.